Hello and welcome to Conscious Living Radio, where we air here every Wednesday in Vancouver on 100.5 CFRO FM Co-op Radio in Vancouver. And again, you know, state of the world, we're still doing pre-records and broadcasting on Facebook Live. However, we still air every Wednesday from Co-op Radio uh, here in Vancouver. And, you know, interesting times call for interesting solutions, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. And it's that time of year again where we're getting ready for the annual Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, which, of course, is now going to be virtual and all done online. So we're looking forward to uh, introducing and integrating some fun new ways of bringing live conferences online. And today I'm here with my cohort, co-creator, MC, Jack of all trades, Masters of Lots, Mr. Stephen Gray. It's always a pleasure to have him on board as we do the work that we do. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Mark. Good, good to have you on board. I'm really excited about our guest today, but I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce them. And sure. uh, we'll, we'll really just get the ball rolling with that. Good. Well, this is going to be a, a mostly extemporaneous uh, introduction because I know Bruce fairly well. In fact, I interviewed him recently on uh, my YouTube channel, Stephen Gray Vision, uh, and this, there will be some more in-depth information there uh, that might not get covered here if anyone wants to check that out. Uh, and by the way, Mark, uh, do you or you'll probably get to it later, but do you have a discount code for people? Uh, if I do, to? but I, I, I tease them. I'm going to put uh, it yes. in there later. We'll drop yeah, okay. a bomb you know, so people can uh, have that. And we'll give them Bruce's uh, discount code. Yeah, you bet. It's the it's the Ed Sullivan Show approach. You had to watch almost all of the whole hour before they would bring the Beatles on. You know. Of course. Um, well, you know, it's marketing one hundred and one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and also very manipulative, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's get let's get down to it. So um, there is a bio on our website for Bruce, uh, Dr. Bruce Damer. And rather than reading that out, uh, it talks about some of his accomplishments in the uh, scientific field, which are quite mm -hmm. remarkable. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but for our purposes, well, so he's, an, he's, he's defined there as an astrobiologist, but for our purposes, and Bruce, you can correct me on this, but I think I heard you say when we spoke on the phone the other day that you might accept the term scientific mystic. Um, uh, yes, he's nodding, folks. So, okay, we can we can work with that one. Yeah. And so, um, Bruce, I, I don't think you'll mind if I if I get a little personal here, because you've been pretty open about the fact that you were, uh, as a child, unusual, um, maybe, you know, kind of borderline autistic, even uh, inward, but also really, really sensitive to energies around. And so I think that you're just that kind of person, you know, combined with, uh, and pardon me for embarrassing you, uh, you know, a brilliant uh, intellectual mind, um, you've had that kind of sensitivity, which, you know, when you've worked with medicines has brought you into some pretty deep and insightful places. Um, and so, the uh, uh, oh, yes, uh, as I say, this is pretty extemporaneous. So like, I'm, like I said, I'll leave people to read the bio on our spiritplantmedicine.com website if they want to know the sort of official bio, so to speak because that way we can just get into it. And the only other thing I want to say now is that uh, there is a lot of information at damer.com, D-A-M-E-R.com, including many of his Levity Zone podcasts. Levity might sound like they're um, uh, humorous or something, but it just means light as opposed to uh, weighed down by the burdens of society, I suppose. Um, anyway, uh, and so... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we can just get right into it because, Bruce, I think the kinds of things that are relevant to our conference uh, are issues that we have been talking about recently and that you've been talking about in webinars and on Levity Zone and so on. And I think it's the central issue of our time. And I could ask you a you know specific question about that, but perhaps a general one would allow you some free range to extemporize. I better stop using that word today. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, um, and that would be, you know, how do you see what's going on right now in the world and where are we going? Or perhaps more accurately, where could and should we be going? Well, you know, in, um, we've been engaged in this quest for figuring out or trying to get clues as to how life began. 
uh, on the earth perhaps about four billion years ago and one of the things we've discovered is that there were these nonlinear jumps in capability throughout evolution's history so for example in human history there could have been such a jump when language emerged because it was such a, a crazy innovation that allowed our species to spread globally. So humans or proto-humans before language were so different than humans after language. And right now, uh, and, and th those kinds of, of nonlinear jumps are driven by stress, evolutionary stress. So for example, a, a language could have emerged because East Africa completely dried out and forced humans, the few thousand surviving of, of humans into South Africa. That's sort of generally accepted pathway for how we ended up with the mitochondrial Eve, how we ended up with a common mother, because we had a very small surviving population. But it could have been the emergence of language that caused mitochondrial Eve's gene to conquer all of the rest of the, the hominid world. And stresses do it. So an immense climate change stress uh, was on our species at the time and we're pre-adapted for climate change mm -hmm. when we hit europe we hit the glaciers that were advancing in uh, one of the four last ice ages and we adapted to that so we are creatures of climate change so what's happening now is a wake-up call uh, it's a global scale climate uh, change stressor is now hitting our species and that COVID is also such a stressor because COVID only jumped into the human population from very stressed animal populations in China that humans were in close contact with so, so close they were eating those animals and so you get a very stressed situation from climate change from overpopulation from degradation of ecosystems and you get uh, viruses jumping around populations. And we are a huge reservoir for viruses to, to express themselves. So, and viruses and pandemics were an intimate part of human history and our evolution far back. We've just forgotten about it. So for example, the yellow fever uh, at the time of the founding of the United States, you couldn't stay in Washington, D.C. in the summer because yellow fever was coming through and it would lay low and kill thousands of people. Pox, various poxes, chicken pox, small pox, were constant plagues. We, we were plagued by plagues. Uh, we were evolved by plagues. The Renaissance started because a plague wiped out city after city. Uh, and, and the Great Fire of London resulted in London's abandonment during the Great plague of 1665-66 and then the fire broke out and it led to London being re-engineered along a Roman grid plan by Christopher Wren. It led to uh, Isaac Newton fleeing the university in order to go back to the farm to survive the plague and coming up with the calculus. You know, so things like this. So these are pattern breaks and we've just gotten used to not having plagues because plagues uh, were defeated by our genius in modern medicine, but they're back. And so question from here on out, whether it be plague or displaced populations or fires, these are things that humans are intimately familiar with. This is not like something new. And we can draw from history and we can draw from evolution that these are forces to force us into, in a sense, growing up, waking up and growing up. Because perhaps what's happened since, say, the 1920s or 1930s, when we had the last global pandemic, 1919, 1819, was uh, we've been in a kind of coddled world. We've gradually come into a, a middle class uh, a system where we had vaccination against terrible things like polio, where we had uh, things provided for us by our brilliant enlightenment technology. Um, from TV dinners in the 50s to organic foods in, of today in kombucha worldwide. We, we have luxurious travel. We, have, we don't have the same murder rates that we've had historically. We have healthcare, we have literacy in unprecedented levels. But what we haven't had is the stresses and duresses 
that humans have been subject to for our entire uh, six million year evolution. We've forgotten about it and it's returning. So we could either see it as a kind of a chicken little in the sky is falling situation, or we could say, this is an old pattern. And this is an old pattern that has come just like a wildfire in California or Oregon or Washington. It's white, it's clearing out underbrush that actually shouldn't have been accumulating. We mismanaged our forests here so much and they grew, they grew in a way that native peoples never would have allowed. We mm -hmm. grew all these pecker pole trees everywhere uh, because we disrupted the land. And so the fires are cleaning that mess up that, that we introduced when we built houses right in the middle of the matrix of the forest, interrupting the forest's health. We built roads over it. So the response is to clean it up. And fire was always the mechanism to to clean and revivify forests in the West, even into the East, but certainly the Great Plains also burned all the time. So we're discovering that uh, we made a mess and the biosphere is, is adjusting to clean the mess up, to self-regulate. And the mess we're also making that we've made of our own psyches, consumerism, uh, uh, Terrence used to call it consumer fetishism. That's Terrence uh, McKenna, by the Terrence, way, for anyone who's been hiding under a rock. Yeah. <laughs> and all of these things that we know are bad for us that we still do, the foods that we eat, uh, the news that we promulgate and we pass on, the panics we allow ourselves to get into to maybe drive our adrenaline or our cortisol, the kind of, the kind of things that we know actually aren't good that we, we all uh, promulgate in a, in a sense to some degree. Uh, there's a fire coming to clear that out. So in a good, a good example of it is uh, there's a whole like segment of the population that has come under the sway of almost like a medieval kind of the return of the medieval, pan medieval panic cults. Mm -hmm. And in these cults, uh, there would be someone coming through in crazy black robes through this, the town spouting off all of this news. And the news supposedly had come from somewhere and he, he or she would panic a town and garner some kind of benefit or control or just do it. So the panics of plagues, panics of you name it. Uh, this is where witch burnings started, for example. A lot of bad behavior came from individuals who got the microphone effectively. And cre to create the panic, this is their self, uh, in a sense, to create their self-worth uh, to bring this news, which was quite destructive. And this was pretty common. I mean, if you read the literature of the day, uh, even the formal literature of the 17th century, which showed that the thing of the time was basically Catholics burning Protestants and Protestants burning Catholics and, and garroting them and these very violent, horrible acts in England. I have a, a two volume set about the martyrs of the Protestant world. That's just simply a catalog of people who were summarily executed by the Catholic power structure. This is what they were focused on. And so what, what generally will happen, I think, so one of those is people who come through social media or a community and talk about make stuff up or pass on stuff that isn't science-based, that isn't common sense. Like if there was a pandemic that required a vaccine in order to survive, there may be people who are these anti-vaxxers who simply apply their logic to any vaccine. They don't read the science. They don't remember polio. They just simply apply uh, their mechanism to it. A whole community decides not to take the vaccine and it's wiped out by the pandemic. So natural selection so will select out that community. And who's left? Well, it, it's kind of a hodgepodge, but the lesson will be learned that we need to trust medical science to some degree. We, we can't just trust random people. And this happened during our wildfires. So during the wildfires, anybody who came into our social media space promulgating nonsense things like 
energy beam weapons lighting fires in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and someone had done a Photoshop fake of this. The neighborhood here just stamped it down. Instead of promulgating it, they basically did self-policing and self-healing uh, of that, saying, no, we can't afford any attention on anything other than what is real. And we need to watch the fire chief's daily report. We need to study these maps. We need to understand the actual not made up stuff, not fake news. We need to have real, re, from real authorities. We, we need real authorities. We need to support them. They will support us. We will get through this. And so there was a wake up call in this community of, you know, it's time to grow up because it's, this is about our survival. And I think that we have an opportunity now in the world uh, to push back and to say, we're creating, uh, this is an existential threat uh, everything coming out of our current political leadership in the U.S., a lot of it is an existential threat to our very lives. And, and we're watching the pandemic will grind on for the next two years here, where Canada reports no new cases or no new deaths, or New Zealand has no new cases. We're going to be grinding through this thing for one, two, three, four more years because of uh, the incredibly uh, poor leadership and the, the poor attention to reason and to uh, measured approaches and discipline. Uh, and so we're going to have learn a lesson of uh, letting ourselves be f under the sway of a panic cult and like in the Middle Ages. And the United States as a country will potentially be selected out. Parts of it will be selected out of the world economy, out of culture, uh, out of viability or not. And a country like New Zealand is, with no cases, is selected in. And it's just Darwinian processes at work. Uh, it's upsetting. It, it's unnecessary. We, we, the United States could have been in the same situation as Canada, where discipline and persnicketiness were <laughs> seen as a national priority. And we decided as a nation, we're going to do this, like we did the Apollo project here in the 60s and how the the nation uh, built its infrastructure in the 50s and it, it came together on uh, nuclear disarmament at the end of the Soviet era. And there was a, there's a lot of working togetherness that happens in the United States. When you fall under the sway of these sort of panic cults, uh, and I just came up with that term for them. I don't think you can find that in Wikipedia. Uh, we pay a price. And so to learn the price you pay for uh, not questioning uh, the people promulgating information and for uh, uh, for promulgating that information yourself, the price is going to be shown to us. And so that's that's kind of what's in the maybe the zeitgeist today is immense smoke is pouring over the landscape of the whole West, yes. West Coast. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, you've painted a pretty clear and stark, I would say, picture there. Uh, so now you've but I know you to be a, a, actually a deeply optimistic person. You believe in, uh, you, you know, I know this from things you've said uh, to me and other people, that you have a, 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 a deeply committed belief in the potential of humanity. And uh, the kind of idea that I've been really excited uh, hearing from you has to do with this notion of there's different terms you've applied to it, like the development of a meta-organism that uh, you see unfolding uh, that is able to um, affect the probability factor of the, in the field. Um, and I think even your title of your talk at the conference this year is uh, involve, includes the word, uh, the, something to do with the development of a meta-intelligence. And also in our interview, you used the, the term uh, development of a global mind. So I'm wondering if you could uh, clarify that the, those concepts that you see um, actually happening, these you know manifestations. Yeah, that's a thanks for swinging us back away from my forays into politics or policy are often uh, uh, not filled with a huge amount of uh, uh, you know good information because I'm just not that kind of a person. I'm more of a gearhead, uh, but still on the factor on that uh, on that tack natural selection is really uh, does it all. So for example, natural selection back at the origin of life, what we think 
is that there were no individual protocells in competition. They're the first primitive cells that were had just a few lifelike properties. That the system that led to the living world was a collaborative network known by us, uh, uh, described by Carl Woese in the 70s as the progenote. And we're launching a whole branch of progenote science around this, that the unit of life is a sharing network at its fundamental core. So if you take a look at what is going on with human beings. So as COVID was breaking, I was saying to myself, thank goodness it broke in 2019, not in 29, 2009 or 1999, when we were still on modems. Because 2019, the nervous system, the exo nervous system of the internet is, is powerful enough. It's just powerful enough. Like this platform that we're on now is, is stable and reliable and scalable just enough that we could layer on top of ourselves an exo nervous system called the internet that at this level of the 2020 level. And that, that exo nervous system, along with smartphones, mobile communications, GPS maps, all that has allowed many countries to, to deal with this virus and this pandemic threat. And certainly has helped us with our wildfire fighting, keeping the public informed, keeping people out of harm's way. We have this powerful new exo nervous system. There's a meta idea around that, which is whenever you connect something densely with frequent communication, you create a meta organism. Now, a good example of that is in the redwood forest just outside here, the connection is mycelial mass. You know that Paul Stamets will talk about it, spirit plant medicine. Um, Mycelial mats are a highway for nutrients and even signaling between uh, tree systems, especially the, the redwoods and the thick duff layers. There's this immense meter thick of a mycelial mat if you dig down into it. And so the forest is now being understand, understood as a meta organism itself. The trees are not in isolation. Trees exchange nutrients and information with other trees and in fact, Trees that are sick get healed through the network. Trees that have now just become stumps continue to live even though they don't produce, they have no photosynthetic uh, capture mechanism, no leaves. Their root system is still alive. It's still contributing to the network of the forest. So the, that tree continues to live even though there's no tree above ground. Pretty crazy stuff. So when human beings are connected more densely and we've never had a, a dense, you know, ultra planetary network of communication like we have person to person. I believe that what that's going to do, just like in any biological system, it creates a meta organism so that as one part of it feels a threat, it communicates with the other parts of the body and the body responds to the threat. And that human beings are un no, not unlike any other organism are gonna to move towards survival and solutions at the lowest level. So I had a vision last year of this. I was just sitting down in the house and suddenly there was this vision in my head and this is what happens to me in, uh, on a kind of a lot of the time. I saw this, this pattern shadow on the window and it was uh, like a tetrapod, kind of like you'd see in a, a newt moving forward one step at a time and there was a body behind it. And that kept coming up in my consciousness for days Usually these, these sort of downloads repeat until I get the message <laughs> and I don't hang up the phone. You know, I just, <laughs> the answering machine's always on, you know? Uh, so this, I realized that this tetrapod shadow thing was human beings waking up as a meta organism. Mm, human beautiful. beings were connected densely enough that we're becoming a single body and not just a mind, but a body. And that any living thing even at the meta scale, even if it's mycelial networks, even if it's the progenote network, will explore phase space for survival and for procreation. So I think that just as there's division, just as there's isolation of people, people versus other people and groups, just as there's atomization and all this going on, at the same time, there's this connection going on that could, and just in time, like a good Hollywood thriller, you know, it ends with a car chase, right? 
<laughs> just in time, the meta organism wakes up and pulls us through and we don't even see it. We don't even really feel it, but we can mm -hmm. see the signs of it everywhere. So I would put it to you that if you start looking at this thing, you look at the wildfires here and the wildfires in Siberia and the wildfires in Australia. There's a resonance, there's empathy for all those people that now in Portugal, there's wildfires. So wildfires are shaping our organism. There's a great fear around wildfires because they pervaded our lives in East Africa as well. But fire was a, a powerful tool that we learned to harness and, and we woke up to it. It's an intimate companion for us. But the wildfire thing is shaping our species. It's shaping our meta organism to pay attention to how we come, how we land on the land. How do we see the land when the land is on fire? The land can burst into, into flame. It's a different relationship. We, we realize here in California, we were never managing our forests. We were never keeping our forests healthy. We we're ignoring that. And so somebody from Siberia might say, but we need help too. What about a Taigan forest? Or what about British Columbia where all the bark beetle uh, kill is burning? You know, it burns. And then somebody from another part of humanity says, well, that's the grasslands moving north. That's what happened in an ice age ago. And then that person in British Columbia or in, in Siberia might say, what does that look like? Grassland ecosystems are moving into the Arctic from the plains. And because we have intelligence, because we have the internet, because we have people who care about other people who are caught talking across scientific and cultural barriers, suddenly the people in Williams Lake or in Verkhoyansk are like, wow, our new reality is grassland. We're going to learn everything there is to know about making the healthiest grassland we can, because that's the inevitable consequence of what has just happened with the bark beetle and then the fires. And we adapt and we, we adapt intelligently. So then we decide to bring healthy grasslands into British Columbia or, or the Arctic. And then we find out that the grassland sequesters as much carbon or more than trees do. And so in a way, all of this is like this huge shaping mechanism, bringing us back to old things, the meta organisms responding as an organism. And by gosh, human beings are the toughest, most procreative, adaptive survivors of, of any species that's ever existed on this earth, we can and will make it through. And uh, as Steven you know, Pinker talks about the angels of our better nature, we're going to have to turn and face the trauma in our own souls, in our own childhood upbringing, our, our planetary trauma, our family traumas, to stop the madness. We cannot fall under the sway of this sort of panic cultism. Mm -hmm. And But it requires each of us to look inside as to why we're attracted to that, why we promulgate that. We need to come back to a, a kind of common sense and caring and empathy that you see in disaster zones that is still present. Yeah. And so you know, all of that being the waking up of the meta organism. Beautiful, yeah. Uh, that reminds me, uh, in our conversation on the Stephen Gray YouTube, for the St Stephen Gray YouTube channel, um, you you told a, a, what I thought was a fascinating uh, story to make a point about a friend of yours uh, in your circle who had a lot of trauma and would act out and so on and so on. And the, the overall point you were making with that story was, uh, I'm not sure I can do it justice, so I'll have to turn it back to you, but it had something to do with the idea that um, uh, people are starting to recognize their own wound as their own and not project it out onto the world, and that's changing things too. Can you kind of straighten me out, straighten us out on that one? Yeah, it, it, for me, um, being more of a gearhead and an engineering type, I only got interested in the human OS. You know how nerds are always like, I don't want to deal with people. They're too messy. I don't even <laughs> look them in the eye, right? <laughs> They're a lost cause. I'm building my tech, right? That's a typical gearhead nerdy response. Well, eventually this nerd got interested in his own trauma around the year 2000. I got interested in 
uh, what is going on inside me? Why is it that I get driven this way and that way and have cycling thoughts and all that? And so I started a long program uh, that I'd started in the 80s of why am I surrounded by concrete and I can't have any feelings? That was the 80s. I broke that open in the 90s. And then in the 2000s, uh, having avoided uh, plant medicines like the plague, literally until I was 37, because I, I felt a discomfort, a danger with them, mainly because uh, of all of this uh, download kind of space I live in, I didn't want it messed up. I didn't want the operating system of visionary states to be messed up by plant medicines. So I completely avoided them until I met Terence McKenna. And it was clear that his system wasn't messed up and his clock wasn't screwy and the springs weren't hanging out. And so we, we, we enabled stuff for each other. And then I visited his, his worlds and he visited mine. And then I discovered that these medicines were a doorway into the healing of my own traumas. And so for the next five to eight years, that was the primary goal was the discovery of the little parts inside of me. And when I first went to do jungle medicine in Peru, I think in 2011, uh, 12, um, I basically requested the medicine to not give me visuals, to not give me, you know, the forms that people describe. I don't want kaleidoscopic visions, not even Looney Tunes cartoons, which eventually I asked for in the end. <laughs> it's like, give me some Looney Tunes. <laughs> Parents used to say, give me the dancing mice. Uh, so I said, I, I need healing. This medicine is for healing. I need to understand who I am. How did I boot up as a human being? So that as I enter middle age, I can like unravel the operating system that drives me so that I don't have to be driven by the same OS until my grave. I can make a change. And that change was the discovery of the trauma of my birth uh, when I was uh, born and given up as an adopted baby in the, in the hospital in Victoria, re-experiencing that and then unraveling that and owning that. And then that unraveled a whole layer that was deeply buried. And then other layers have unraveled since. And I'm a new person. And as well as joining uh, another a program of healers that do this without even the medicines, just with uh, insights, energetics, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of practices that do that. It's sometimes called parts work uh, or internal family systems is kind of a, a name of it. That each of us is an internal kindergarten. We've got parts running around. There's a, a scared little part probably, and there's a, there's a more egotistical part that's like a see me attention. There's a mental part that's always getting justification by, by taking mental cycles. There's a worry part, different than the anxiety part. They're, they're members of a family that's inside you. That's why they call this internal family systems. And I encountered those in the jungle. I met them. I was literally sitting with them. And I basically said, dudes, you know, I can see that you fight that one. The body gets attacked and stops breathing when the mental part starts going. So then the body is strangled because I stopped breathing. But it's a, and I can tease those parts away and say, you know what, the mental part don't strangle the body and they stopped. And so I, the, even physiological things unwound in that point. And as we learn how to do this, as like our friend who would just get triggered into screaming, she now owns that. She broke down one day when we were over at the house of barbecue, when she had a screaming uh, trigger, she came out to us and instead of sort of hiding, she came out to us, her friends and said, I'm gonna do something, the most vulnerable thing I've ever done in my life. I'm gonna tell you why I scream. And it's my deepest, darkest secret. And it has haunted me my whole life. I scream because my family all screamed when I was a little girl. That was how we interacted. And I can't help myself. Anything that happens, like the garbage cans end backwards, something that I would get screamed about, I will scream and I can't stop myself. And we came around her and we hugged her we said, we love you. Now we know. Thank you for, sh for sharing. We know where this comes from. You can 
don't feel uh, afraid of triggering again because we'll just come around you and support that little part as it acts out. And after a year or more, her screaming episodes, her triggers started to decline because there was always someone there who knew where that was from, allowed her to nurture that part and be nurtured in that part, group in group, and she let it go. And it would have been something she would have carried to her grave. Mm -hmm, and so for humanity, whether it be we complain about Donald Trump, why did they do this? Or a person in your family, why did they do this? There's a little part inside Donald Trump. He was brutally treated by his father. You know, he has, you can diagnose what he has. I mean, many people have. But the empathy we have is that this is a suffering human who's acting out and causing much more suffering in the world. You know, Buddhists teach us that to own to own that suffering and to be with it and not project it onto the world. And of course, we we will learn the lessons that we someone who's going to be a, a model for us and in leadership can't be acting from parts. Mm -hmm. They cannot be coming from parts. They have to be grounded. They have to have done their healing work. They can't qualify for the job. End of story. And this is one thing that we'll, I think, learn in this century. And in Silicon Valley, uh, leadership of companies now, large companies and new ventures, uh, even venture capital people are, are asking the question, is that person that we're about to give 100 million to, how, how, what's their healing path? What's their mm -hmm. spiritual path? Because we know from experience that if they're a dramatic person or they're a rigid person or whatever, and there's some deeply unresolved issues, it could affect our investment. Mm -hmm. And so we need to ask those questions now that we never used to ask. And of course, VCs have their own parts. But you know, in the group that I work with here, we have VCs in the group that are doing their own parts work, their own healing. And so this is new in the culture in the last five to 10 years. It's absolutely brand new that it is coming into leadership. It's just percolating up. And the self-awareness that I am responsible for what I project out, I'm responsible for my little inner kindergarten is probably the biggest move uh, in probably a hundred years in, in human development. Bruce, you've made it clear uh, how the medicines uh, helped your healing journey. Uh, how I, I'm not sure what the best question is. I'm sure you can interpret and take it where you want to. But you know, we're the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, so you're going to be talking to uh, an audience of people who uh, are interested in the psychedelics in particular. So maybe one question we could ask is uh, how central, how important are the psychedelics going to be for larger numbers of people as we go forward in this kind of, you know, consciousness transformation, reconfiguration, development of, uh, you know, the global mind and all that kind of thing? I think that we we saw different phases of the psychedelic movement. So in the 50s, there was the intelligentsia that were discovering that secret room for the first time into the early 60s. Then we had its explosion into culture, mostly through LSD and cannabis in the 1960s. And then it was really, an, it, was a, it was almost like a, a flowering of people out of straight jackets into creating a new culture of the Grateful Dead and Woodstock and the music and the avant-garde arts and the sciences and chaos theory. And so much came from liberated people, liberated out of the straight jackets of you know, the previous several hundred years of formal society, formal tiered society. So that was a phase. I think in the 80s and 90s, we discovered the shamanic part of psychedelics, that this was an old tradition, very, very old tradition. We also discovered uh, the empathogens in the 80s and 90s, MDMA, MDMA, MDA, 2CB, things like this. We discovered things that are direct heart healers that were brand new in, in, in human history that are coming into legal use now when the clinical trials or the phase three trials are done. So we discovered that. Then we discovered the most powerful substance that humans have ever probably put into the system, which is the, the direct DMT in their homologs, 5-MeO-DMT. No real uh, evidence of its history in in indigenous culture, but it's a new discovery from the animal kingdom. Amazing, and that, that creates 
such a shattering and a breaking down of mental structure and egoic structure and all the parts, it just creates a great big mush. And then you go into non-dual union, a lot of people report on this. You go into the Samadhi experience that the great uh, teachers and masters of 3000 years have described. So we found that doorway there too, in the 2000s, I would say. And now we're in the, the 2000 teens where all of this is merging with all this medical science, neuroscience, medical efficacy for treating trauma. It's coming into legal use. It's coming from an underground into the culture. A uh, huge amount of storytelling, a, a, a huge amount of integration, even behind the scenes, legalization and decriminalization going on everywhere. It's rising in society, all these tools and simultaneously along with internal family systems, along with breath work, along with uh, yoga, along with uh, flow states in extreme sports and understanding what that is, along with the gut, the gut microbiome and understanding how that affects us. Uh, uh, DNA sequencing, how we're made up, what our fundamental code is. All these tools in the 20 teens just coming in simultaneously and people using them simultaneously for their healing, for their their personal empowerment, for their mental empowerment, for their physical empowerment. All this stuff is happening. And we hit the 2020s with this tremendous tool set that, that humanity has never had. And I think it's a tool set that is up to the job of what we have to do, which is to heal us, to wake us up, to also allow that meta organism to guide us a little bit more, to allow this greater synchronous field to trust that to say, there is a bigger power here. It's not God, it's been called God. It's been called you know, a panpsychist phenomenon or whatever, but perhaps it is a field. This is something that I'm working on currently. It's above the human meta organism. It's basically the matrix that life makes out of the substrate. Life is constantly trying to shape probability from every, every single neuron that fires every single protein that's expressed by a, a messenger RNA through a ribosome, it's all tracking and shaping probabilistic outcomes. It's in a dense intercommunication network and it's infused with memory. That system, I think, creates a meta layer, a kind of synchronous field that is a tool for us that also is guiding the organism, the meta organism of human beings. And we can, we used to call this prayer where you made a prayer and uh, you know we prayed every day for some result and it may may come to you in your lifetime these days we put out an intention and then a, a day later we're on a zoom meeting with the very person who has the answer to a deep profound question it happens so fast and then suddenly you're in a con a, a, a conversation with someone who's and agrees to come to spirit mountain medicine virtual version and then they make, mix over here and it's so rapid. It's more rapid than the physical conference can do. It's different. But the synchronous field is rocking probability. So if, as a species, we have the collective dream that we will survive on this planet. We will heal a lot of the planet. We will calm the energetics of the system down both in our psychology and in the planetary system. We will, we will manage it better by the end of the century, and we make that commitment, the field itself will wake up to that, I believe. There will be solutions coming constantly. Like my neighbor who started a company that monitors tree forest health from orbit called Pachama. He lost his house in the fire two weeks ago in, the for in, in a forest, ironically. His company actually tells a company like Microsoft what carbon credits are worth. So when they buy carbon credits to preserve rainforest, Pachama does the actual test and measure from space. So our friend Diego is an answer to a dream. He has connected the carbon sequestration economy with big corporations directly with a startup that's very efficient and well run, despite the fact that he's now a victim of, of climate change himself, having lost his home. And yet he goes on, he carries on. So in a sense, all of this is happening. It's not often reported, but this synchronous field and this human meta organism is moving powerfully toward its survival. I don't think it's going to be willing to give up. 
And when we go into uh, psychedelic and visionary states, I think we meet the field and we meet the meta organism and it's more clear it's coming into resolution every time we contact it it gets more awake more aware and more usable and more dialogable because all my life since i was nine years old i've been having a dialogue with this system and it's rocking now i mean i've had so many interactions with it. i trust it so deeply and it's guided all the science and the evidence is all around that it works so now our interaction is a moment by moment basis. You know, Stephen just texted that they're gonna be on at 10 minutes to the hour. When do mm -hmm. I go up? I was guided by the feel of when to come up. <laughs> I was literally, I stepped in a certain direction that I changed direction. That's how I work, that's how I roll these days. And because I've trusted so deeply and it's, it's produced so well and I don't have to figure things out. So in some ways, humanity does not have to figure this whole thing out either. There is another OS, there's another meta system at play that is going to help pull us through. That's a beautiful vision. That I think I'd like to sit, you know, everybody on this planet over about the age of 14 down and make them listen to what you just said because it's so inspiring, so hopeful. You know, well, uh, Mark has for, told for me, me that. Well, for me, that just explained my life. That's kind of been my mm -hmm. operating principle mm -hmm. for a number of years after I had an awakening a long time ago. And it, it kind of shifted. And now I, I just trust everything will always work out. And it's amazing how it always does. And in yeah. what you explained and described there, it's maybe go, oh, huh, that explains it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully yeah. said. Mark, you'd said you wanted to keep this under 52 minutes or something. Should we start rounding it up? Yeah, we're just going to wrap it up. We've got about five minutes or so left, five and a half minutes. You know, we, we can stretch some time, of course, but we can talk about uh, whatever you want to leading into the conference or what have you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how, you know, Bruce or any of us could top, you know, that last, you know, vision of what we're capable of and, you know, where we could be going with, uh, you know, putting our minds and hearts mm -hmm. to it. I find it a deeply moving um, vision, you know, and uh, important for people to, because, uh, you know, Bruce, I'm sure you would agree with this, as these older systems crumble, um, there will be, and there already are, um, a lot of people, uh, well, actually, you talked about it early in this con earlier in this conversation, hitting the panic button. Um, and I think a lot of people need to hear that this is not all dark going to hell in a handbasket, you know, situation. This is, this is the um, kind of clearing out that you talked about that needs to happen for there to be uh, the dawning of a sane, you know, planetary scenario. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I love what you said, like, as just as you started sharing um, in regards to COVID and the virus and pandemics and the history of mankind and you know how that has even changed because we weren't used to the seeing and dealing with these patterns, mm -hmm. which is, you know, historically it, it makes a lot of sense as well. And then to see what's happening in the world today is just really made me pause for some thought for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think really what it comes down to is when you look back and you look at the stresses that the biosphere has been through much more intense than actually we're experiencing. There was a thermal maximum around the boundary of the Eocene where planetary temperatures were 23 degrees Fahrenheit higher. That's an immense heat event. Well, I said several million years. We may be heading back there, uh, which would not be a good outcome, but the biosphere uh, pulls through those. It pulls through asteroid impacts. It pulls through. Uh, whether human beings pull through along the line, I think we can and we will. If we're reduced down to the population that we were in South Africa 180,000 years ago, and we're a very small population, we certainly, we will pull through, but we won't carry much of our, our culture and our technology with us. Mm -hmm. So depending on the scenario of how narrow the neck is, or do we pull the entire global system through, which would be actually pretty optimal, or do we have a big loss factor and we pull a portion of it through? Uh, that's going to be determined by natural selection and the dynamics of the planetary system. And we really have to be prepared for multiple scenarios. Mm -hmm. Mark, do we have, can we stretch it out a wee bit? I, I have, there's a question I'd really love to ask Bruce to comment on. Does it, you re, do we really have to stop in three minutes? 
well, to keep it to an hour, we have to stop soon. <laughs> the show, well, it, it'll get cut off on the air for everybody who's listening and watching. It'll just cut off at, at one time at, at the okay. hours. So, okay. yeah, of course, that's why we have an hour time limit. We're going to edit out some of the chit chat, though, right? So you can get a little more time back. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So I won't ask that question. No problem. You want to wrap it up then, Mark? Well, I just want to thank Bruce for, for joining us this afternoon and, and sharing, you know, this insight and your story and some of your personal factors that kind of led you on the journey, like with plant medicines and your own healing, because with, with the conference that we're part of, that's, you know, that's what it's all about is really healing humanity and how plants are, are a big helper and a big teacher in that. So I just want to thank you on behalf of myself and our community in the spirit plant medicine world, the conscious living world. I just want to thank you for your work and your time to join us today. And I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing your talk at the, uh, the conference coming up in October. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Hey, my pleasure. And I'd love to talk to you again about some of the other stuff you were talking about. Cause mm -hmm. wow. We, I, so I feel like we just scratched the surface and that's why Stephen wants more time. <laughs> and, and to me, that's a, that's the indication of a great show because I had a good friend one time who always said, always leave them wanting more. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> so, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ed Sullivan, now you've made people wait right to the end. Um, do you now, are you now willing to, to share the secret code? It's not a secret code. I just like to keep people engaged. But because the conference is virtual this year, we, you know, we always have discount codes and things. And we really want to inspire people to trust uh, the power of a live conference because they are getting better and better all the time. And as Bruce is our guest, one of our speakers, he's got a code that I'm going to share on his behalf for him. And it's Damer 2020. It gives you an 11% discount on any of the ticket tiers. And uh, you can join us there with that one. It is in the comments down below in the Facebook live feed here. It's going to be on the page that uh, you can find this this. Um, interview in this conversation on consciouslivingradio.org. All the information, everything that you need to get a hold of Dr. Bruce will be there as well if you want to follow up on his work. And it's also in the comments down below on this Facebook uh, post as well. So yeah, Damer 2020, D-A-M-E-R 2020. <laughs> and check out damer.com uh, for all the Levity Zone podcasts and a lot of other very interesting information. Yes, and, and also to, to learn more about the up other speakers that we have at Spirit Plant Medicine, uh, just visit spiritplantmedicine.com. You can get all the information there, uh, uh, what's going on for the conference this year, and we're, we're quite looking forward to it. October 23rd, 4th, and 5th for that one. Exactly. From the comfort of your own home, from anywhere in the world. And this is what I love about virtual events. And it's kind of what you were talking about, Bruce, is, you know, these instantaneous things that happen is we're able to reach a wider audience. We're able, people are able to come in and, and join us when they haven't been able to before. So this becomes one of the benefits and the learnings in, in these kind of environments anyways. So, yeah. So one last question, your, your ultimate wish for the world. If it was just to work out beautifully, this all kind of settles in a good way, how would that look? No, no time for that. <laughs> oh, there's still time. No. <laughs> uh, my ultimate wish in the for the world is that each of us in the next week comes to a state of complete rest where our systems stop processing. And in that rest, we find a little fragment of bliss because if we come out of fight or flight just for a moment, we can land our systems. And that's gonna help everyone around us and everyone uh, within us, all our parts, and it will help the world if we can go to that place. And uh, that the world isn't all about all this churning. And when you sit outside and you hear birds and even if it's smoky or whatnot, uh, there isn't churning, it's mostly in our heads. Beautiful. Thank you for that. And how about you, Stephen? Any last words before we sign off for this episode of Conscious Living Radio? No, I, I don't want to step on that. That's a beautiful image. Great. Well, again, once again, Dr. Bruce, I thank you so much. It's been a pleasure e-meeting you and have, having uh, and being part of this conversation. And I look forward to seeing you again uh, in just a little over a month's time at Spirit Plant Medicine Conference. Uh, my name is Mark Cron. We're joined by today by my good friend and co-host Stephen Gray and our guest, Dr. Bruce Damer. You've been listening to Conscious Living on Co-op Radio 100.5 FM right here in Vancouver. Thanks for listening.